Thank you for tuning in into another episode of I Start First podcast. And today, today might be, and I know I'm biased, but one of my favorite episodes because the person I have on as a guest is absolutely extraordinary. She's an extraordinary coach, extraordinary Enneagram expert, extraordinary human being, extraordinary woman. She's probably one of the raw and the realist. I love talking to her. She's one of my dear friends. And what we're going to talk about today is what it really takes to show up in your truth, to step into your superpower, to step over your fears and your insecurities and your doubts, and most importantly, finding someone who is going to help you integrate all these new tools into your life. Stay tuned for my episode with Tracy Amon. Hi, loves. Welcome to I Start First podcast, the show for boss babes who start ideas, businesses, dreams, and lifestyle. I'm your host, Alenka Cullinan, founder of I Start First, speaker, author, and business coach, aka queen of pushing boss babes off the ledge. On this show, I chat with epic humans who are guaranteed to up-level your business and mindset. Are you ready to sparkle up? Let's go. Hi, ladies, and I'm so excited today. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of I Start First Podcast. And I'm just going to tell you this. I am so excited. I literally can barely contain myself sitting in this chair today because of who my guest is. I mean, not only she's an exceptional coach, unbelievable human being. I mean, she's the realest woman I know. I love everything she stands for. She's Enneagram expert. She's built business to multiple figures. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to take the whole time, you know, basically telling you her accolades. I want her to tell you her story because the way she shares goes straight to your soul. So get ready, get some notes out. We're going to be taking a lot of them today because my guest is Tracy O'Malley. Hi. Hi, beautiful. I love you so much. Thank you. Uh, Love is very mutual. And I was, you know, by the way, I should mention that if you're not signed up for Tracy's Becoming Bulletproof podcast, you better go find (laughs) it because I mean, she is dropping bombs. Like there are true bombs flying all the time. I love listening to it. Her guests are amazing. She goes for really incredibly honest questions and answers. So I love that. But back to you, back to you, my love. So, (laughs) oh God, I mean, where do we even begin? Where do we go with this? Um, Tell them a little bit more. I mean, I know it's, that's what you kind of explain to people working with Enneagram and being an Enneagram expert. But what, what does it really stands for, for those girls who have no idea what it is? You know what? Like the Enneagram is something that's out there and very trendy right now. And that's good and not so good, right? Just like with anything. And I've been involved with the Enneagram for, gosh, eight years now. And it's, it's not the end all be all, but it is one of the most powerful tools I've ever used personally you know, in my own life and then working with thousands of other people. Because I think as, especially for you entrepreneurs out there, as we kind of dive into entrepreneurship, all of a sudden we realize, oh shit, we got some wounds that are coming to the surface that are causing us to sabotage, have imposter syndrome, compare, all the shit, right? All the shit. And then we hear out on the gram, you got to do the work in air quotes, right? Like what the fuck is the work? Right. And so what I love about the Enneagram specifically for me and how I've used it, you know, with thousands of other people is it's a tool that makes the air quotes work. Not so overwhelming because if you're like me, I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. Don't look at at one day, one day. (laughs) Thank you. However, like with that many decades under my belt, there's a lot of stuff that's buried and doing the work can seem overwhelming. And I know a lot of you know you got to do some shit and you're afraid of it. And using this with the right person, obviously, you know, there's funny memes out there. There's a lot of misinformation. There's Mm -hmm. all sorts of tests out there that are completely inaccurate. You know, working with somebody who's very skilled, not only in knowledge of it, but how to integrate it 
mm-hmm. is key, really, really key. And it makes like this deep dive into self-awareness, communication, how we can leverage every person we talk to way more effectively. So, yeah. you know, eight years ago, I went kicking and screaming into an Enneagram kind of session with my therapist. I was like, what the fuck is this? I don't <laughs> want to do this. Don't put me in a box. And quite honestly, I was in rehab when she made me take it. So she's like, honey, your best thinking kind of got you here. So how about we try something different? I was like, well, touche. And that's where it began. And, you know, being in rehab, clearly I had some work to do. Yeah. And because I started with that, I was like, okay, this makes a lot more sense than who I am. Mm -hmm. And I could look at it with compassionate eyes and a compassionate heart rather than the shame hits and the shame cave and the shame cycles that had gone on for generations. I was like, I'm done with shame. Shame is like this, the secret silent serial killer of all Mm -hmm. good things. Mm -hmm. And it clearly wasn't working for me. So using the tool of the Enneagram early on helped me kind of dive a little deeper into the work. And clearly I took it next level, my work personally and then professionally. Um, But it is a powerful tool when used properly with the right practitioner. Yeah, no, I love it. I'm literally getting goosebumps here, but I want to bring back something you just said, you know, I mean, you've stepped into it, you've stepped into some of you and you said it's a lot of it is stepping into your fear and your trauma. Mm -hmm. And you've had a few experiences with those. And I don't, I mean, you can go as deep as you want to, but give them some of the, some of the cliff notes on some of the traumas, because I mean, everybody looks at you now, like you said, on the gram, Tracy O'Malley, incredible expert, you know, build incredible business, have been successful mom, has a beautiful kids, but it didn't start there. No. And like you see the glory, but you don't know the story. Right. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, the, the cliff notes version, I'll kind of go through a very quick timeline without all the details. I mean, you listen to the pod, my podcast, you'll hear all the details and, you know, there's nothing I don't share at this point, but, you know, at the age of four, I heard one sentence that changed everything for me. You know, I, I've experienced sexual trauma. I grew up in an alcoholic home. I grew up with a mother that was emotionally incapable of being a mom. Quite honestly, she was a beautiful person, but emotionally incapable of being a mom. And at four years old, I heard a sentence about the day I was born where my dad was joking, but mind you, four-year-old ears were listening, hearing this. And my dad told the doctor when he came out and told my dad, he had a daughter and he said, keep her. I don't want her. Mm -hmm because he wanted a boy. And he was totally joking. Like if you knew my dad, you knew he was joking. But when four-year-old ears hear that, they take things literally. And the belief system that was birthed that day Mm -hmm. was that I need to be as close to perfect as humanly possible in order to be worthy of love, approved, accepted, get the attention I need. And so from the age of four on, the perfectionist in me kicked in, you know, which led to eating disorders, starting at five years old, um, you know, all sorts of things, sexual assault at 10. Like I said, grew up in an alcoholic home, um, sexually assaulted again at 17, you know, had my own unhealthy relationship with alcohol and food. I was being tag teamed by a few eating disorders. Um, I was a workaholic, like I said, a perfectionist, you know, and then my parents divorced when I was 19 and like the reality of what that was, my dad introduced me to his married girlfriend the day of the divorce while I was on a boat with him. So I had nowhere to run. And for those of you know me, you know, I'm the queen of the Irish duck out. Like, and, and for me to not have an escape plan was not good. And then watching my dad and my uncle getting into fist fights over it. Like, you know, it was constantly like, okay, I don't want to say anything because fights happen. I don't want to make waves because fights happen. Um, you know, from an early age, my dad, because he wanted a boy, he talked to me like a boy mm-hmm. all the time. I mean, I know everything about sports, which I love, you know, don't get me wrong. Um, but about money, he told me, you know, you make all the money, you control it, and that's where you'll have all your power. And I saw that to be true because I saw how he abused that power with my mom and controlled her with it. Mm -hmm. And so that drive to be successful early on came. I didn't know how that would look, um, but I, I've had to work through a lot of things around money because, you know, in one sense, I'm hearing the message, make the money, control it. So you have the power and control and you won't be vulnerable, which yes, I wanted that. But in the other, that, that beautiful feminine 
you know, wholesome part of me is like, but I don't want to be abusive. And Mm -hmm. so I would make money or be successful and then sabotage it. Because if I get too successful, make too much money, then I could be an abusive asshole. Yeah. And I could, you know, I have a history of emasculating men when it came to that. And I did not want to be that. I did not want to be that. So, you know, that's kind of the crib notes. I got off. I, I ran out of Chicago, which is where I grew up. And you know, got married at 21 and like a good Irish girl does had back to back babies like Irish twins. And by the age of 25, I was a married mom with two kids working two jobs, putting her husband through college. And that's just what a good, perfect girl does. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, talk about, talk about taking perfection to the next level, but I mean, we both know at this point that perfection is not a human quality. (laughs) No, it's the biggest form of, it's the biggest form of self-abuse, quite honestly. That's right. That's very true. And so, I mean, getting there, I mean, what was it that finally was that straw where you're like, I have to go fix this. I have to go. And it's going to be as drastic as rehab because not easy, right? Your mom, your kids are looking at you. Mm -hmm. It's harsh. You're a single mom at that point. And, you know, it's basically everything I'm sure inside you screaming, don't do that. Just keep floating to keep, you know, keep being in the zone. It is semi comfortable. It is semi working. So you can coast like this for a very long time. So why? What was it that finally you were like, I can't do this anymore? Yeah. And that's the thing when you're like an achieve high achieving over driven person, woman, like you can get by on that because you have success mm-hmm. on paper. Everything on paper looks freaking great. Mm-hmm. And that's how we justify our shitty behavior sometimes. And I did. And it was before I got to rehab, 12 years before I knew that I couldn't outrun, outwit, outlast, outthink, out anything my past. I thought getting married and moving 3,000 miles away across the country, I could just set up shop in Arizona, have my own white... F- picket fucking fence. And I got this. I'm going to be the parent that I didn't have, even though my parents were great people. They just, you know, they did the best they could. And I thought setting up shop with a new clean slate would eliminate repeating the patterns. Mm -hmm. And I remember as clear as day, the day my daughter turned four. So I was looking into the eyes of my own four-year-old self in her And I saw a very different four-year-old than I was, you know, it was a free spirited, happy, like had not a care in the world. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it hit me because I was filled with rage. Like how the fuck did somebody put that little girl through that? Meaning me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was then at 28 years old, 19, now 20 years ago that I knew if I didn't repair this, I was going to repeat it. So 20 years ago was my first kind of dabbling in some kind of healing work and recovery. And I would take a few steps forward, but then, you know, that internal belief system was like, who the fuck do you think you are? And so I would sabotage and that went on for another 12 years until the straw that broke the camel's back was I turned 40. Mm -hmm. I started to see history repeat itself in my now teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was divorced. I made it through the recession with a bankruptcy, with a foreclosure, with a divorce, with a now my dad passes away suddenly after a 12-day cancer diagnosis. I was repeating history and I was in a relationship that was abusive and shitty. And it was like I was going to repeat the fucking cycle I was running Mm -hmm. from. And I didn't want that for my children. And I knew the only way to stop it was to Mm -hmm. repair it. And and show them a different way. Cause it's one thing to, you know, kids and people you coach and yeah. anybody you lead, you know, if you're leading in your home or leading in your business, they're going to do what you do, not what you say to do. Yeah. And so I knew I needed an entire, an entirely new toolbox. Yeah. And so that was the day I was like, waving my, waving my white flag. My dad had died like six weeks earlier. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm 40. I got a lot of life left to live. Yeah. And those kids deserve the very best possible chance. Yeah. And so I went into the, I was a um, high-end executive in, a, in the car industry at the time and very good at what I did, even though I hated every second, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't receiving any support raising my kids as far as finances go. So like the full weight was on my shoulders and I walked into the owner of the place that I worked and he was grooming me to run the place at some point. And I walked in, I said, I can't do this another day. I'm going to go pack up my desk and I'm going to quietly go away 
I am not coming back because if I do, quite honestly, I'm going to die. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know why I need to do it. Yeah. And I, I thanked him. He was very good to me and very kind to me and poured belief into me when, you know, I felt so shitty. Yeah. You know, I was a fucking fraud most of the days, like, you know, just on autopilot. And that night I went home and told my kids I was going to go to rehab. And my son, who was 14 years old at the time and angry at me, looked at me and said, mom, I will give you up for the rest of my life. I will give you up for 30 days to have you yeah. the rest of my life. And those were very serious words. And I, I took, I was like, oh, I'm not going to mess this up. Yeah. And so the next day I walked into rehab, completely committed, unconditionally committed to the process and willing to let go of anything that didn't yeah. serve this greater purpose. And that meant pretty much wiping out everybody in my life except those two kids. And that's what I did. And, you know, that first day in rehab, I heard the statistics of how many of us actually make it. Yeah. And it was, it was 2%. And, you know, the smart ass that I am was like looking <laughs> around the room and I'm a numbers person and I'm kind of <laughs> doing some calculations in my head. And the very first words I spoke in rehab is I apologize to all of you because none of you are going to make it Yeah, because I am the 2%. So, yeah. but I mean the bravery, the okay. bravery, gosh, like I, every time you talk about this, I just get goosebumps and all kinds of feels because the bravery, because, you know, we, we, it's like you said, everything looks great on paper. We do such a good job telling people the story, right? Making the story everybody wants to hear, but turn inwards like this and going in and wiping it out and saying, I am going and redoing the whole thing from, you know, this is it. This is the beginning. It's huge. It's huge. And I'm sure even though, you know, your kids obviously had huge belief in you for your son to say that that's extraordinary, but I'm sure there's still that fear, you know, am I going to come back on the other side? Am I going to show up at the biggest, fastest version of me for them? And, you know, now seeing what you're doing now and having built the business and going completely different route, right? Going into the industry that's misunderstood so many times. Uh, you know, it's like you literally are walking in the opposite direction of traffic at all times for a very long time. So clearly you understand the power of honesty and the power of communication with yourself and with others. Uh, what is something that you had to work on with your kids when you came back? Well, you know, it was interesting when I was going to rehab, pretty much everybody in my life was like, you're not bad. Why are you, why are you doing that? And, and it was very clear to me that when we start to step into our greatness, mm -hmm. It basically is putting a mirror in front of the people in your life. Mm -hmm. And it was very evident by them saying that to me. I'm like, well, I don't give a fuck if on your, you know, range Standard of scale, scale yeah. like that just means my standards are much higher than yours. And I have a bigger calling on my life. And mm -hmm. I didn't say that out loud, but I was like, this is very eye opening that mm -hmm. when I step into who I was designed to be, it makes people very, very uncomfortable. And that was the number thing I needed. Number one thing I needed to work on. Because as a perfectionist my whole life, I could be a chameleon and, and be whatever anybody needed me to be. Right. And that was step number one is like, all fucking masks are off. Like, you're going to get Tracy, like now 2.0. Yeah. And I don't give a fuck if you like it or not. So that was step one. Um, as far as the kids went, you know, when I was in rehab, obviously I was disconnected from the entire world, which was a blessing. I know so many people can't do that. Um, so I'm so grateful for that. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. But it was very evident in when I was taking my Enneagram test and then reading all the qualities of my type unhealthy. I was like, oh, well, that's very eye-opening. And that explains why the way that I communicate, what I mean isn't landing on the hearts of my children the way I intend. And I don't need to be right. I don't want to be right. I just want to be effective. And I want them to receive the love in the way that I mean it and it's not landing and that's on me, yeah. right? They're not just pain in the ass teenagers. They're not, mm -hmm. they're beautiful, beautiful kids. All of, all of the teenagers, I love teenagers because they just want to be seen, heard and understood like all of us. Mm -hmm. And the minute I got home, like, obviously I had time. I, I really had to work on my own self-awareness first and understanding myself before I could try and be something for them. 
And when I got home, I, I identified that they were different than me as far as their type of personality. And so I just started trying to talk differently. I started to talk in a language that each of them individually would hear because they're very different too. Like I can't just put them in a, in a pile and say, I'm going to communicate to both of you like this, deal with it. Like that <laughs> yeah. doesn't work. I mean, that's the generation you and I grew up with. Like, right, right. you know, especially the, those generations had like 20 kids or whatever, right? you know, and that's the only way they could do it. But I, I knew that I needed to speak to them differently. And I knew that with each of them, I needed to be very aware of how they receive me. Mm-hmm. And it's very different than when I, I mean, I grew up with do as I say, not as I do. You're yeah. better seen than heard. And so for me to have that inner dialogue for 40 years to all of a sudden say, not on my fucking watch another day. Right. Because these guys deserve better than that. Yeah. They need to be heard. They need to be seen. They need to be understood. Mm-hmm. And so I just started with that and it changed overnight. Mm-hmm. Overnight. And they were like, they were angry. Yeah. Because I had a lot of broken promises before. Mm-hmm. They trusted me enough to say, go do this. Mm-hmm. I believe that you say it's going to be different, but you better walk your fucking talk when you get yeah. home. Yeah. Right. And, you know, just that shift in the way that I communicated with them, we had bullet fr- bulletproof trust. And, you know, a few weeks after I got out of rehab, that relationship I was in completely like exploded, like yeah. sending me to a hospital kind of exploded. Yeah. And I remember the day that the dust flew out of the driveway and he was gone forever. The kids looking at me like, oh, shit, what's she going to do now? Mm-hmm. What's she going to do? Because my pattern when all hell broke loose was not good. Yeah. And I remember seeing that fear in their face. And I just, and even though, and I said, my heart is breaking right now. This is devastating to me and my heart's breaking. And I want you to know we are going to be more than okay. I don't know how, but I do know why. Mm-hmm. And I want you to trust me. We're going to be more than okay. And I'm going to be okay. Yeah as the dust was flying out of the driveway. And I was like, holy shit, like this shit works. This shit yeah, works. But I'm sure internally you're like, ah, but how part is gonna, is gonna have to be figured out soon, right? Yeah. So, I mean, look, you, you're going, I mean, ladies, if you're listening, like I literally would rewind this right now and just sit with it for a minute. I mean, this is continuous stepping into this is fear. This is scary. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's going to work, but I don't have a choice. I'm going to make this work. Make this work. Make. Work. I mean, you're breaking patterns daily, hourly, weekly. So I know that some of you who are listening struggle with this and you don't have that consistency and you break a couple patterns and you fall down and you fold and you feel like you don't have that in you to get up, but you do. I mean, that's the part of breaking the patterns. I mean, we don't like change. We don't like fear. We don't like being in situations that make us uncomfortable. But the reason that, you know, Tracy is sitting here today telling you the story on the other side, far, far gone from where she was before is that it's stepping into that continuation, no matter what, no matter how, the how gets figured out in the process. And your how, Tracy, was a whole different other ball game. I mean, talk about, you know, going from consistency and having that you know executive status and having the paychecks and having a very successful career essentially Mm -hmm. on paper to now you're back home with rehab single mom trying to figure out communication and you know whole new lifestyle and now something lands in your lap that is misunderstood by masses that requires Mm -hmm. tremendous leadership skills what do you do My goodness. I remember (laughs) six months earlier, you know, when my dad had a 12 day cancer diagnosis and, you know, I was working a corporate job at the time and very good at what I did and worked more than half my income was commissioned. So getting on an airplane and just leaving that wasn't an option. I wasn't receiving child support. I didn't like, it was all on my shoulders. And I remember on the airplane when I got the call saying hospice just got called in, you need to come now. And I was a fucking mess on that airplane. Um, not because my dad was dying. Cause that was, that was yeah. pretty much done. Yeah. I was so freaking angry that I was in a vulnerable position where when that call came 12 days earlier, I didn't just get on a plane. I was so angry that I was in a position that, you know, somebody saying you can go, but come back. Cause you're really good at what you do mm-hmm. and we need you. 
I was angry about all of that. And I had this ugly snot bubble crying prayer on the airplane saying, God, please just give me some kind of opportunity. You, you, I know what's in me. Yeah. I know what's in me. Please give me an opportunity to let that shine. So next time I, I, I should ever get this call, I can just up and go. Mm-hmm. And ironically, you know, the rehab happened six weeks later. And then six months later, you know, I was interviewing for jobs and I didn't want to be in the car industry anymore, but I had 15 years of history in that. And headhunters were after me because I was good. Yeah. And, you know, a woman in the car industry that's good is yeah. like a hot commodity. And my ego certainly liked that. Like, oh, hell yeah. The ego was like, oh, bitches, you don't even know <laughs> how good I am. Right. <laughs> but the ego isn't what was running the bus anymore. And I remember sitting in an inter- interview saying, I stopped halfway through. I said, I apologize for taking your time, but I am coming out of my skin right now. Mm -hmm. I know I'm good at what I did, but this is not who I am anymore. Thank you for your time. And I left. And literally like the next day, a girl that I used to work with was talking about something she was doing. She looked great, had energy. I needed energy. I felt like a truck hit me. I'm like, give me some of that. Please give me my box, then leave me alone. And about a week later, I felt like I swallowed a fucking rainbow. I'm like, I feel amazing. You know, I was like 40 and feeling great. And I Googled Googled this company that was yeah. in this box. I was like, oh, shit. It's one of those things. Yeah. Because I didn't really understand what that was mm-hmm. when I bought it. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I had a panic attack a little bit. Yeah. Like, Oh shit. No, no, no. And I was like, it kept like coming in my head. Remember that airplane ride? I was Mm -hmm. like, Oh shit. Like, that's not what I meant by an opportunity. God, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. like take it back. Give me something else. (laughs) This is a not funny joke because like, I get that this is a network marketing thing, but do you realize God that I just wiped out my entire fucking network? Mm -hmm. I am that single mom that went to rehab now I'm supposed to be this health and wellness, you know, leadership guru, yeah. join my team. Like really people are going to be busting down the doors. <laughs> I don't think so. But that was my old dialogue for about two seconds talking to me. And then all of a sudden I felt like this power in me. It's like, now's your time. Mm-hmm. Now's your time. What's the best that can happen? Yeah. What's the best that can happen? You do have these gifts inside of you. You are a natural born fucking leader. Mm-hmm. My Enneagram type says that when I'm healthy. Yeah. yeah. When, when, I'm, when I'm healthy, that Enneagram type is a world changer. Mm-hmm. And I had had the words, the qualities, the, the, all the descriptions of the healthiest version of my personality taped to my mirror for months. Mm-hmm. So it was time yeah. to walk that journey. And put it in into play. Like practicing was great. It was time to go to the fucking Super Bowl. Yeah. And so, r- r- with a whole lot of fear, I'd never been vulnerable publicly in my life. Yeah. And on April first, two thousand thirteen, six months after rehab, I talked about it publicly for the first time, and fifty three people wanted to know what I was doing. And I was like, "Whoa, shit! Whoa, shit!" Like, now what? And of course, that perfectionist in me, you know, she still lives there. I was like, well, now these people expect me to be perfect and like this expert. And I tried to be perfect for about five minutes and I I could already feel burnout coming. Yeah. And I understood the way this compensation plan worked. And if I burnt out, I couldn't build an empire. I needed to leverage myself. So that meant I need to not be perfect keep it simple, speak everybody's language of what's in it for them in order to be duplicatable and to build this like my life depended on it because it did. Yeah. And so after about five minutes of trying to be perfect, I'm like, fuck this, like perfectionism (laughs) kind of got me into this mess to begin with. So, you know, if you want something different, it's going to require something different of you. And so I just like embrace like, I'm this hot fucking mess. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how we're going to build this empire but we're gonna and yeah. buckle up because this yeah. rocket ship's going. Are you coming? And people are like, yeah, I have no idea what you're doing, but I want to, whatever Kool-Aid you just drank. <laughs> I mean, and, it wasn't, and it wasn't even about the product so much. It's like my yeah. energy and the belief and yeah. love and confidence. And it yeah. wasn't bullshit. 
-hmm. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do, but I, I was like, oh, I know what's happening. And I saw it, Alenka. I knew exactly what I was going to do. Absolutely. How? No fucking clue. Yeah. yeah. But one by one, people started showing up and, and those beautiful leadership skills that I was, but that are innate in me. Yeah got to shine. And I got to pour into people in a healthy way, not in a what's in it for me way, like I did right. most of my life, but a what's in it for them way. Yeah. yeah. And I knew if I helped enough of them get what they wanted, Zig Ziglar says, I'm going to get everything that yeah. I want. And I did. Yeah. And in two years time, two years time, I had only brought in personally 82 people, mm -hmm. but my leadership skills and, and pouring into people turned those 82 people into 15,000 people, which turned into my first million dollars of income wow. in two years. Wow. And all of a sudden, that single mom that went to rehab was the poster child for what's possible. Yeah. And they were, people were so fucking tired of seeing the perfect life. Oh, yeah. People. They're like, this is what I want. Like, cause right. that's my life. Like I'm yeah. a hot mess. Like if that hot mess can do it, <laughs> right. so can I. And so I embraced yeah. it. Like after 40 years of trying to be perfect, like if I had known this hot mess thing was going to help me not only be successful, but I could go to sleep at night being completely who I am right without a mask, without like keeping a story straight, without like being a chameleon to whoever need whoever was in front of me, like I was just Tracy, take it or leave it. Right. Right. They were no, that's, they loved it. Yeah. And I love, and I loved it, which was of the course. most important thing. And my kids loved it. Yeah. And you know, with, with that came the money, which gave me freedom and choices and perspective. And, and it was so interesting because I knew that that was just a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I still do that every day. My, my organization is upwards of a hundred thousand people today, wow. seven years later, which is amazing. Um, and I obviously still pour into that and the leadership mm -hmm. there. Anybody that wants to be a leader, like that's the most beautiful set of training wheels you can oh, ever get yes. with no overhead and no, no risk. Like why the right. fuck wouldn't everybody start that way Yeah. instead of yeah. trying to grind it out as some coach? Yeah. yeah. The reason I have like a little bit more breathing room is because that machine is running. That's right. That's right. right? Like so but the level of communication you've provided, I mean, that had to be such a huge it was I mean talk about walking the walk and practicing I mean it's like you said you have to pour in every single one of those people in their style right because we're so used to like this is me this is how I talk this is how it's supposed to be take me or leave it it's like so stupid I hear people say that I'm like no it's not about you and it's not how it's supposed to be and you need to know who your audience is what their goals are what are you doing for them it's really all about them like you said and so First of all, for the ladies who are listening, I hope you like just checked yourself because I mean, yes, yeah, single mom from rehab going to over seven figures, creating massive, massive organization, changing lives for people essentially, but more than that, honing your leadership skills and your communication skills and now completely revamping that. Now you're on, I don't know, level Tracy 6.0, 7.0. I'm either and, like three or 4.0 at this point. Yeah, yes. And but now obviously i can only imagine how all of that training per se is coming back into being and working with enneagram and understanding what people are and how they're so different and you and i had this conversation about you you know younger generation who seems to be having somewhat of a difficult time processing their emotions and feelings because they're so bombarded. And I know a lot of you who are listening right now are going to relate to that. You're bombarded 24 seven with some bullshit on social media, how yes, not only have to be perfect, you somehow have to have a certain level of skills or whatever. And you have to know all the things, but everything looks glossy and pretty and everybody wants that. And then 24 hours. So that processing how does enneagram help someone with truly like understanding and creating that self-awareness in the first place well you have to be unconditionally committed to understanding yourself first mm. so when you were talking about you know honing your leadership skills you have to know how to lead yourself first mm. like the reason i am such a fucking fantastic leader is because I lead my for myself first every day. Right, I, I'm gonna, I I'm start gonna, first. I'm gonna I start it. first. Yes. <laughs> you all better bookmark this part. Play it again and again because notice how she said it. She didn't freaking hesitate for one second. Nope. She said, I'm a freaking fantastic leader. 
I mean, you have to own your shit. Like, and she owns it every day. She stands for this woman. She's not hesitant. She's not shy. She's not trying to downplay herself. She's not being small. She shows up in that light and in that power. And that's why people gravitate to you right here. What you just said. And I love it. I'm sorry I interrupted. It just was so no, it's, good. It it's was so good. It's the only way. Yeah. It is the only way you'll have sustainability in your business, especially yeah. if you're leading people. If you can't fucking lead yourself, you're a fraud. Mm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And and I can say that because if you spot it, you got it. And I yeah. operated in that method of operation for close to four decades. So mm. I I say that with so much love and compassion for you because it's a, a, eventually the wheels are going to fly off the axle if you don't get a, a handle on this. So, you know, just like Olenka built this amazing brand and community, I start first. You have to go first. Yeah. And you have to be unconditionally committed to your own process every day before I even lead my own children. Mm-hmm. I have to be able to lead me because, yeah. you know, it's so important in everything that we do. And um, I'm not even sure what you asked me at the front end of this question. <laughs> How does working with Enneagram helps people okay. with that awareness? Yeah. So, you know, I have studied myself and I continue to. Almost eight yeah. years later, I learn more about myself every day. And I'm just going to tell you right now, for those of you listening, just realize that you're going to have to be committed to your own work until your time on earth is done. Mm. There's no like graduation from it. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, and especially if you want to up level your life, I mean, I upgrade myself as much as fast as Apple upgrades their, you know, operating <laughs> systems. Like, it seems like every other day, Apple's saying you have a new update and you know what? I feel like that too. Like every yeah. day I have a new update. Yeah. Be committed to that. So mm-hmm. with the Enneagram, like knowing myself and knowing, like I started to study how each type would receive me when I'm under stress and how they receive me when I'm at my best. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so obviously, you know, wherever you focus on is where you're going to go. So if you're just fixated on all your unhealthy traits, you got to, you got to know what they are Mm -hmm. because you need to know when you're under stress, but it doesn't have to be like this shame thing. Like I understand that that's just four-year-old Tracy who heard that story about the day she was born running the bus when I'm under stress. Right. Mm -hmm. And I could have so much compassion for myself instead of beating myself up. It's just a compass. Yeah. Understanding that those are there is just a compass. Okay. But really focusing on where I, where am I at my best? How does this type receive me? How does this type receive me? And then once I could really know that, then when I was talking to people, I could pretty much gauge within two minutes who I was talking to. I can narrow it down, at least guesstimate. And I know how to speak that language because I've studied it Mm -hmm. after studying myself. So like with my children, I know what they, what is their love language? I know what their deepest motivation is. I know what their deepest fear is. I know what their deepest desire is. And so I speak into the desires and the motivation and their heart space. And when people are seen, heard, and understood, anything is possible for them. They actually start to believe that you believe that. Like not only are they borrowing my belief, they're actually buying into it. And it's true. I'm not blowing smoke up anybody's ass because I know who they are. Yeah. And that is my superpower. I can see anybody within minutes and it scares some of you. Mm -hmm. And then there's some of you, it feels like you're home for the first time ever. And that's my goal, like for everyone, because we all deserve that. Yeah. I went 40 years without being seen, heard, and understood. Some of it not my doing, but a lot of it was my own belief that I bought into, yeah. right? Yeah. And when we're seen, heard, and understood, we, we don't have imposter syndrome anymore. We don't get caught up in comparison and procrastination and self-sabotage. I mean, it still tries. Yeah. It still tries. But the more that we are self-aware and have compassion for all parts of ourselves anything's possible, you guys. And the people you lead will feel that from you. My kids, I mean, I have a 22 and a 23 year old today that like, that's the greatest success I've ever had is to turn that bus around. That bus was heading for a cliff. Mm -hmm. And I turned that shit around on a dime. Yeah. When they're teenagers as a single mom with no money at the time. Mm-hmm. I turned it around just through effectively communicating and being humble enough to do my work, to do my work. And you know what? Like, my God, 
why wouldn't I carry that into business? It was, yeah. that's how you, that's how I became bulletproof, right? Like right there, it's, I'm standing on the front line, pouring love and belief into people and I see them. Mm-hmm. And I'm speak. it's almost when I'm looking at every person I come in contact with, whether it's in my network marketing business or people I coach, or even if I'm on a stage speaking to 20,000, I look into the eyes of each person as though I'm talking to their four-year-old self. Mm-hmm. I do. Oh, I, I, literally- have, I like picture all of our little broken children that, you know, had our <sighs> hearts broken, that had a bandaid slapped on it. And I'm like, listen, you, you've done what you've done to get by. And it's okay to have compassion for yourself for that. And the shit stops today. You don't have to do that anymore, you know, but you have to love yourself for what you you've been through and like, but you have a choice. Yeah. You know, cause I hear all the time. That's just how I grew up. This is all I know. I'm like, yeah. And you have the choice to know a different way. That's right. That's right. We all do. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely your superpower. I mean, ladies, I hope you're hearing this. Like I said, I would say this last part, (laughs) she just gave you little affirmations. You can hear every single morning, because if you don't have that belief yet, uh, it's completely fine to borrow some of Tracy's, but that secret sauce, that zone of genius, that superpower of seeing people for what they are and helping them realize that this is it. You don't, you start today and you do something different and you do start first because nobody else can force it upon you. That's where, you know, all the magic happens. I mean, I can't even tell you how extraordinary it is, how, you know, being around you, it's like, yes, you can feel that you can bullshit vibes. I say that all the time. So you either got it and you project it and you leave it and you breathe it, which you do, or you just talk about it and that's a very different ball game for all of those of you who are listening if you're in phoenix make it a point if you're not in phoenix make it a point we will put everything about tracy her social media into show notes so you can connect to her because truly i mean an honor every time i'm around you it's such an incredible reminder of what a powerhouse you are how you present yourself and what a beautiful soul you are truly but before i let you go i know it went by like five seconds which i literally we could have this for hours there is a woman out there who's listening right now and i'm gonna you know, go there. And she maybe is feeling like a fraud today. And she's scared and she is lost and she doesn't know how to be different. Or, you know, maybe she's tried and failed multiple times and she wants to be just like Tracy. What would be one advice you would give her? Well, <clears throat> the reason I do what I do is because I would have died for somebody like me when I was 28 years old and knew that, oh shit. Right. So, You know, I always speak to what I would have wanted to hear because what you just said is exactly how I was feeling. I felt like I was a fraud. I felt like I was white knuckling every day. I felt like I was at the end of a very tiny little strand of a rope. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that you at any moment can decide that the shit stops with you. You are not what you grew up with. Even if you grew up great, like I'm not saying all of us are fucked up or anything like that, but we all have wounding. And I want you to know that like if um, you broke a bone, I'll tell a quick story. Um, I broke my arm when I was six years old. I um, fell off like a jungle gym like thing. And I was six years old and fell off of it and put my left arm down and snapped it. Mm. And because I was so worried about a fight about money, a fight about why weren't, why wasn't anybody watching me? I didn't tell anybody about it for two days. Um, I hid it. I hid that I broke my arm as a six-year-old. And sure enough, two days later, I couldn't hide it anymore. And yes, there was a fight about it. There was a fight about the money. There was a fight about why wasn't anybody watching her? Like la 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 la, mm-hmm. everything that I was worried about. And you know, if you break a bone and you don't get it set properly right away, what do they have to do? The doctor has to go in and re-break it and it's painful and it hurts, but it's important because in order for that arm to work properly at its most optimal way that it was designed to do, that bone has to set properly. Otherwise I'm going to have problems. I was six years old. Otherwise I was going to have problems the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. The thing is you guys, 
And for that girl out there that feels like it, like I just can't do this. Sometimes our heart got broken early on and it didn't get healed properly. And be brave enough to go in and re-break it all over again. I had to re-break my heart all over again. And that meant opening it up. I had to have open heart surgery, so to speak, Mm -hmm. in order to really let this heal the proper way so I could show up in the world as who I am, you know, fucking bulletproof. And that doesn't mean without feeling or without getting hurt. I still get hurt all the time. Like I'm human. I do have feelings, but it doesn't have to run me today. So be willing to go in and re-break your heart all over again. You don't have to linger there long because I promise you, once it gets set properly and healed properly, it moves a lot faster. The reason mm-hmm. you're having such a hard time is because it, it didn't get set properly back then and you didn't know. Mm-hmm. And so you don't need to beat yourself up for it, but you have a choice. Yeah. Like you aren't what happened to you. Yes, people hurt you. Yes, you were an innocent child. So was I. But it is up to you if you are going to buy into the belief that you're a piece of shit one more day, it is that you have the steering wheel Mm -hmm. and, you know, let your heart break. You will recover and you will recover better, stronger, faster, more powerful, making the impact that I know all of you want to make. I knew from the time I was 10 years old that I like all that pain at 10 years old already, I knew it was going to matter for something. I didn't understand how or why it was happening, but I knew it had to matter for something. And the only way that that actually got to make the impact and not be wasted was my willingness to go in and re-break my heart all over again. So if you're in that spot, do the work in air quotes, do the real, <laughs> real work that doesn't, I mean, going to conferences and stuff are great and taking notes and everything are great, but you need an integrator. You need somebody in your life that will show you how to integrate all the work. And that is my, my superpower for sure. And, um, but you got to be willing first because even me with the greatest strategy and tools in my toolbox, if you're unwilling, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So just be willing, unconditionally committed to your own process and anything is possible. Oh God. I mean, Ah, listen to this a few times. I'm going to listen to this a few times myself. I love you. You have no idea how extraordinary it is to just watch you and be in your presence and see all of this come out, knowing that you stand up for every word, for everything you do, for every move you make, how intentional you are. So I'm just so, so grateful for you to give your wisdom today to the Sparkle Tribe, to the ladies who are maybe brand new to the podcast and give them that, you know, that slight nudge of starting first, starting today and finding someone who can help them to integrate it in their life. Thank you so much, Tracy. It is my honor. I'm so grateful to call you friend and I'm so glad. Like that was a divine appointment for sure. And I so appreciate like your love and support belief you know, I, it means the world to me. You don't even know. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening to I Start First podcast. If you loved it as much as I did, feel free to tag us on Instagram at I Start First underscore. Share it with your besties. And if you feel so compelled, give us that five star review on iTunes. Till next time. And like always, kick ass and sparkle up.